starting recording. And I just want to say uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my name is Johnny Lee with uh, Peace at Work in collaboration with the Alabama Coalition Against Domestic Violence. We'll be talking about uh, guns in the parking lot laws. Um, and then even though we're specifically talking about Alabama, we'll certainly broadly talk about the subject that applies to other states that have these uh, laws as well. Um, real quickly, uh, a brief introduction to myself, that's me. Um, if you need to contact me, there's my information below. Uh, in terms of discussion, like if you have a direct question, you need a resource or something, I'd be glad to send it. But if there's uh, something you disagree with or something you want to expand upon, I do encourage uh, to continue the conversation in LinkedIn where we can get other professionals um, involved in the conversation. There's a lot of great uh, uh, workplace violence security groups that I am pretty frequent in. Um, and then, if I may, uh, with us is Jennifer Arsinian. Jennifer, I, I took this off of your LinkedIn site, but I don't know if you want to do more of a self-introduction, a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. I'm Jennifer Arsinian, the legal director with the Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and uh, primarily the Coalition's role is to provide uh, technical assistance to allied professions around the issues related to intimate partner violence, specifically domestic violence. Uh, we also are an umbrella organization where we provide direct services free of charge to victims, male or female or children that are experiencing domestic violence and that's 24-7 out of our 18 shelter programs and our shelter programs do cover all 67 counties. So for employees that are experiencing domestic violence, one of the things we really encourage is for the employer to ensure that they have the information of the local program and are providing that um, service to all of their employees as part of just all the information they provide in their EAP programs or other community resource programs. Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, just a little housekeeping. Um, roughly. I guess this is maybe about three quarters of an hour. Certainly, I'll definitely try to keep it under an hour. I'm fine with uh, questions uh, being asked along the way. Certainly, we'll stop at the end and say, does anybody have any questions? But go ahead, interrupt with questions, comments, things you want to add. Um, if you look at your user interface, if you expand out that little uh, link, then you'll see there will be a questions tab. If you enter it in there, I will repeat verbatim your question, but I won't identify them. If you want to you know, if you don't want us, me to say who you are, then I, I just won't. Well, I just won't state anyone unless you ask me to. Uh, so ask questions anytime. Uh, this is being recorded, and you will get uh, a link to it. And also, you get a link to a like a blank uh, certificate of attendance. If you need this for CEUs, you can just fill in the name of the event and date and stuff like that. Um, it, one note, I, maybe I should say here, uh, Jennifer and I talked about this. Uh, about just having more of a discussion, so I think it's just going to be batted back and forth, just as Jennifer and I are going to have a conversation. We hope that you all can join in through this questions tab. Actually, if you really want, you can raise your hand and ask to be unmuted, and then you could speak, and everyone can hear you speak as well. If if anyone wants to do that, um, does, does that all, does that sound good, Jennifer? Uh, yeah, sounds fine. Great. Okay, um, <clears throat> so of course a disclaimer, and you may want to add something, even though uh, Jennifer is an attorney, and I absolutely am not, uh, th by no means is this any kind of legal advice. If you are looking to create your own policies, then of course seek your own counsel uh, regarding that. Um, uh, while we're going to talk more about Alabama's law, um, this there are many, and I'll show in a little bit, there are many other states that have this uh, similar laws, but there might be some differences, some slight changes. We'll try to address the subject broadly, though. While this is a politically charged topic, um, you know, um, we're going to really try to stay off of that side of it and just try to get to the pragmatic, uh, what do we do about it, what are the issues, and trying to really provide uh, both sides of the pictures there, but we recognize that it's a uh, you know, a, a contentious issue. Um, and then with that, you know, part of this, for me, I, I'm doing a lot of speculation. I'm, I'm really wearing uh, a security director's hat through all this about what this means, not from a legal standpoint or from a citizen standpoint, but okay, what do I do now uh, if I was in charge of security at a company? Um, anything you want to add here, Jennifer, about any disclaimer you want to add? 
Well, yeah, I think I would just say that um, we are going to touch on certain areas of the law, but not the entire law. And yes. so obviously, if you have liability questions specific to particular employee actions or in general with your HR issues and policy, um, as Johnny said, you want to make sure that you're getting with your local attorney because this law is a lengthy law. Um, there are places where you're going to need specific legal analysis, and this certainly is not what we're going to be doing today. <coughs> Cor correct. Uh, although I have to admit, I, I may not be able to control myself. I think I'm going to throw in my opinions, and I may speculate, but by no means that any kind of. And I'm, I'm speaking for myself too. Certainly not for the the, uh, the coalition. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll just be uh, throwing out some uh, possible ideas. Um, and, and with that, uh, what, uh, uh, when I organized this, I thought we could look at some of the research around uh, gun control and and. Um, and injury rates, and then briefly we could look at the again the Alabama law. Uh, again, it's by no means, as Jennifer said, any sort of in depth look. Just I really gloss over it. And then let's talk about while, while we're here. What are we going to do? Is this going to increase your risk? Is going to decrease your risks? And, and those are the, some of the issues I'm looking at. Or could it actually improve your security? You know, some some issues there. And then you know, what are we going to do about it? How do you actually apply this within your policies or using your procedures? Uh, th th does that all sound good? If there's anything else you want us to cover, go ahead and put that in the questions tab. I have my questions um, window open to catch any of that. Um, great. Uh, so real briefly, just uh, from what I can gather, um, looking at like the Brady campaign site and the NRA sites about what states have similar laws, um, here we go. And just because I do uh, a little work, and I know Jennifer does too, like looking around the nation, I'm seeing it, it's definitely a trend. Um, you could argue that maybe more conservative states have these laws put into place, but we're seeing, you know, maybe one or two a year, a new one being added. Um, uh, and uh, again, all of the laws, of course, differ state by state. Um, if I may, I'm just going to real quickly just talk broadly about, you know, guns and, and violence. and when we look at workplace homicides, we're finding the majority are done with firearms. And by the way, I'm getting this information from the uh, OSHA, Federal OSHA Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I'd be glad to send you those uh, spreadsheets. Um, however, I, one thing I want to make uh, let people understand um, that the vast majority of workplace homicides are robbery, and so it's it's a uh, like a Wendy's or a pizza place getting robbed late at night, uh, or like a, a a convenience store getting robbed, gas stations, and that's where um, the majority, the vast majority of the homicides occur. Um, when we talk about death in general, fatalities, um, a much bigger issue is suicide compared to you know coworkers or or acquaintances or even like intimate partner violence. Um, although I know Jennifer feels strongly about this, we still have to say, even though the homicide figures may be low, the number of simple assaults, harassment, stalking is much, much larger. In fact, we just put, uh, published an infograph looking at, you know, how much, vastly how many more assaults occur than, than you know, homicides. Um, when I did my own little study, uh, I, I just pulled up and looked at those figures. I looked at 500 uh, domestic violence assaults that happen at work, and uh, the majority, 63% of all the firearms. Um, yeah, I think please. that when you look at the uh, domestic violence homicide research, yep. and um, one, one or two stats I'll just throw out is yeah. that, you know, uh, over two-thirds or almost two-thirds of females that are killed mm. uh, by firearms are in intimate partner relationships. Yeah. So when you look at risk for your employees that are victims, if there are firearms or access to firearms by those abusers, their uh, risk factor is greatly increased because of that firearm in the home. So we yes. know there's a, a, a direct connection between the access to weapons in domestic violence situations and the high rate of homicide. And not just homicide, but you also see a clear indication between more severe abuse mm -hmm. by abusers that have firearms in the home. Interesting. Not even using the firearm, but the fact that they possess one might lead to more aggravated assaults, whether it's you right. know, with their hands or whatever. Right. Yeah. It just increases the risk overall is, is what we see in terms of the connection of access to weapons and batterers. Great. Um, 
broadly looking at some, this kind of relates to the issues even though we are trying to focus on the workplace there has been research looking at uh, again about just the presence of a gun in the home as a risk factor and by the way for any you know this I came from a public health field too like there, there's questions about causation correlation um, and there's you know a question around that but uh, <clears throat> what we're seeing is where there's guns there's more likely to be a homicide and I think that was just following exactly what, what Jennifer just said tons of research out there on this. More specifically, I'd like to point to uh, some folks I used to actually work with. Um, uh, this is out of uh, Chapel Hill, and they specifically looked at uh, guns in the workplace in terms of policy. And so workplaces where guns were permitted were found to have five to seven times more likely to experience a homicide as opposed to places where no weapons were allowed. Um, you could easily, you know, look. I, 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 you may have to pay for this study, uh, and it's pretty technical as well. But um, you can certainly Google it. Uh, when I, I've got it, I can't like, you know, share it. But um, the main points that I want to look at is how this was done. Is they looked at 87 cases and uh, 170 places where, uh, that should have been cases, um, controlled workplaces, and they found um, again. <clears throat> workplace homicides were approximately three times more likely in workplaces that permitted any weapons as those who pro prohibited all weapons. Uh, There's a slight increase um, where you allowed firearms, or you, did, you prohibited guns, but you can allow other kinds of weapons such as uh, knives or pepper spray and, and things like that. Um, but uh, in places where, again, you say, yes, you can have uh, firearms, that they found uh, a greater increase. And by the way, this is not I including accidents. I'm going to talk about that a little later, but this could be very broadly applied to just a, a death, not necessarily a homicide that occurred. So that this is used quite a bit. This study is, is quoted quite a bit in those who are, are uh, against uh, these, these uh, laws. Now, this I just found last night. I just added this slide this morning. Um, but there's a recent uh, study you know, sort of showing the other side, and it's it's a separate issue looking at um, firearm deaths uh, compared from America or United States to uh, Europe, and they're showing in places where there's greater gun control that it doesn't necessarily lead to lower deaths. So I, I just try to be fair here. I try to find a, a different study that uh, suggested that the gun control issues do not actually, um, or they're suggesting do not actually lead to any uh, higher risk or lower risk of, of, of homicide and that that's that paper is actually is publicly pu published so you can get it um, guy okay, I try not to do some sort of uh, white tower jarhead or uh, uh, egghead kind of discussion but is there any that I just want to bring in some of the science Jennifer is there anything else you want to add regarding uh, studies well, again, primarily what we focus on is the correlation between the hom the homicide well, causation between the homicide and the firearms usage. And you'll see, even in Alabama, typically on our homicide rate in domestic violence, it's between 14 and 18 percent each year that of the homicides a firearm was involved. Mm -hmm. So, at the national level and state level, we are just seeing where there is this strong. Uh, connection between a firearm in the home where there's battering going on and the higher risk of lethal violence and when lethal violence occurs it is the use of that firearm. Right, right. And so it's certainly within the part of violence where there's great studies that are done, uh, you know, uh, across the state in a specific state or across the nation uh, supporting that, that issue or that point. Um, Let's let's jump in if we can. Then let's let's talk about Alabama law. And again, I think many other states may have similar ones. But in essence, if and, and this is a broad, broad stroke. There's some details here, but it's basically saying employees are allowed to transport and or store their firearms. It has to be out of sight in their own car, so not the company car, and the car must be locked. And then there's certain circumstances, which uh, I'll touch on a few of those. Another thing, um, just it, this really has nothing to do with. Uh, well, well, this part, but they're saying that, you know, if the employer, um, if there is an issue uh, with an incident of violence due to that firearm coming out of that car, that the employer is, is, is held immune. So it's a protection from civil liability if anything happens because of uh, a person having a firearm. I'm going to talk on that a little later. Um, and then um, there are certain places where they cannot have the, uh, the firearm, and there are certain circumstances when they are not able to possess the firearm in their vehicle. Um, some stipulations that they must have a valid concealed weapons permit, concealed carry, 
uh, or uh, if it's used for hunting, then it cannot be a pistol. Um, they must have a valid hunting license and or uh, it must be during hunting season. Um, one little note, I just got to say there's certain, there's sometimes where it's always open season for certain things like hog hunting, pig hunting is always open. So, you know, I guess you can make that argument there. Um, and then some other issues that, um, Jennifer, you may have to correct me. So certainly you cannot have a, a concealed carry or a permit if you're convicted of a violent crime or if you have a restraining or, or a protection of abuse order against you. And also things like being committed to a psychiatric hospital. Um, I think that applies to the, the concealed carry and, and the firearm, but the, the hunting, I guess that applies as well, that um, you can, I believe, have a, a, a long arm, a, a rifle or a shotgun, even though if you've been uh, convicted of a violent crime, but I'm not positive about that. You must be more familiar with, with especially the Alabama law. Right. I mean, okay. basically, um, felons cannot own weapons, and that's a whole other issue. Um, but the, um, in terms of the domestic violence specific, which would be the only area I have expertise in, is mm. Alabama has no state law related to domestic violence misdemeanors. So you're just going to fall right. under the felony laws. But, if it, but federal law states if a person has a domestic violence qualifying uh, misdemeanor conviction, then under federal law they cannot have a firearm, period, or ammunition. So it's a very broad ban for qualifying misdemeanor convictions under domestic violence, but that's a federal law. It would apply, the Alabama's firearms law does state that a person cannot have an illegal weapon, which includes if they're prohibited under federal state law from having that weapon. So it does apply here because federal law prohibits it. Federal law also prohibits someone who has a protection order from okay. having a firearms of any kind unless there's a duty exception. So if they're a police officer or military personnel, they may have their duty weapon under the protection order. And it is in effect as long as the protection order. If Alabama judges put in their protection orders, the person is to surrender whatever particular weapon, then it's specific to what is outlined in that order. You have Understood. federal law that's very broad, but the state is, um, which does apply under this because it's, an illegal, it's illegal to have a weapon under federal law, but um, state law is really going to be restricted to protection orders where judges specifically put in surrendering firearms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and you're right. There's, it, it gets really complicated at the federal level and then down to the state, and it can even be county or municipal uh, uh, ordinances. Um, if I could argue that that's sort of like a public policy laws, you know, push the legislation internally to an, a, an organization or an agency or an employer, they've got their own rules, their policies. And so, you know, one of the stipulations is the the individual cannot be, an employer can prohibit them from bringing a firearm into the in, into the parking lot if they're in violation of the work of their own internal workplace violence policies. So um, well, I'm going to talk about that in just a, a moment. Now, uh, golly, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm always like thinking of new questions. The questions were about commitment to a psychiatric hospital. Uh, maybe that might be an issue within uh, the federal background uh, check screening. So if I'm trying to buy a firearm or, or something like that, but an employer not necessarily would not necessarily know about uh, the commitment to the psychiatric hospital. So that's um, that makes me pause and think about that because it relates to the uh, private health healthcare information acts, you know, the HIPAA regulations. So just some, some thoughts there. Now, of course, I just want to throw this out here. There's, uh, and, and similar with other states, uh, that there's some broad exceptions, uh, courthouses, law, like police stations, athletic events that are, uh, I believe it's, it's, it's uh, that are hosted by educational institutions, if I'm not mistaken, uh, mental health facilities. Um, I'm surprised schools and bars, there's a, the, the there may be issues where you cannot have a firearm on school property. I thought that that was part. Jennifer, do you know about that? If if I thought firearms uh, were prohibited in schools or a property, um, mine. And again, I don't have the law in front of me. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't um, blatantly say that, but it does allow provisions for them to limit, and that's what colleges and school campuses okay. are doing now. I see. They are following the provisions that allow them to limit, but I don't think there's a blanket statement. But there are provisions where they're limiting firearms. Thank you. Um, 
I, I did talk to a number of, of attorneys about this, and, and there's one clause in there about buildings that have a security around their parking lot. So if you have guards monitoring the parking lot, if, if you have, and it's, it's, I think it's, it's sort of vague, like uh, other security protection measures, um, saying that, like, let's say if you have card access or there's a barrier, a big fence barrier, and you need to uh, punch in a number to enter, if you have those sort of uh, protections in place, then that could also allow you to prohibit the firearms in those parking lots. But I think that there needs to be some more clarification there that may come through. Um, okay, so uh, that, that broadly covers the law. You all could Google it to find the, the exact laws, and you, your attorneys would know how to read that a little bit closer. But let, let's just talk here. Here's the, the, it gets to the point. So a lot of HR uh, folks, and uh, by the way, the Society of Human Resource Managers, um, I couldn't find the actual statement or press release, but I'm positive that they put out a statement saying that they were against um, this law, and many chambers of commerce are against, uh, state chambers are against this. And the argument, of course, is that an employee has a gun in their car and there's going to be some dispute. There's going to be some disciplinary action. They'll get so mad, they go out to their car, get their gun, and come back. Um, this is my speculation, my thought as a security person, that, uh, that it, I believe it, it, that that will be probably be un unlikely that it will be that spontaneous. I get some bad news and I'll decide to shoot someone. Of all my studies, of all my research and thousands of cases I've read, that the subjects usually plan this. They've been thinking about this for a while. There's been some evidence that they've been ruminating on this issue. And even if they um, are getting fired, there's usually they know they're about to be fired. So the point is a policy is not going to stop someone from deciding to uh, bring in a firearm. Um, if I could just spit off a couple of examples, uh, here's one where someone, again, it was argued that this person knew that he was going to lose his job. He cared about his job very much, and it was sort of his whole life. Oh, it was right after the firing that he goes out to the car, gets his gun. He takes a female worker hostage, but then lets her go and then commits suicide. Um, again, you know, we could, who knows what was going on within his mind, but uh, here's just an example of what people are concerned about. And if I could uh, point out another case, this is a little bit more recent, Oh, where was this? Um, I'm sorry, I forgot which state this, this was in. But uh, this person uh, got a bad performance review um, uh, at his employment. He goes out to uh, his car. And, and the question is, I wasn't able to determine were the doors automatically locked, like you have to be buzzed in to enter, or they knew he was mad, he stormed out, and then they locked the doors behind him. My guess at being a workforce development center is that they have an open door policy, you know, the public coming in and out, and that they lock the doors behind them, at which point he, he didn't hurt anyone, but he blew out the doors. He shot the fire, um, he shot out the doors with the shotgun, it jammed. He's stating that even though it jammed, he never intended to shoot anyone, but they did apprehend him without anyone being hurt. Um, so it, you know, going back to my thought here, uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you have any thoughts or any uh, attendees that have any thoughts, you know, what are the chances of someone getting some bad news and they go and get their gun? Because that's, that's the big fear that a lot of people speak about. Well, I mean, certainly under, you know, the intimate partner realm, mm -hmm. that's, uh, we don't see losing control as the basis for people who right. really do want to pose harm, that it is planned. Um, of course, access, the easier you're able to accept, access, the quicker it is to execute a plan, right. um, which is the issue. But, uh, no, I mean, I agree. I think typically people have kind of thought about this. There has been something bubbling under the surface, and, you know, this is, is, is may not be elaborately planned, but is more than just the spontaneous losing control. Right. Uh, this, this makes me remember, I should have pulled up some cases where we did there it was proven that the individual was fired, went home, and I guess like how long can you stay mad? Goes home or comes back with the firearm and then commits the violence. So, you know, it's you know, there there's sort of that point. Now, let, let's bring it into I'm I'm putting on my uh security hat again. If you have um an employee that um you have a concern about misconduct, uh makes threats, harassment then um, one thing is you can always determine, are they in violation of your workplace violence policy? Um, and if they are, then you could prohibit them and letting them know that they cannot bring a firearm into the workplace. You can also then find out if they do, you know, asking them if they are carrying a weapon. And then the, the other question is, if, if regardless if um, they uh, violate your policy or not, 
uh, if a, an employee has a firearm and they're not compliant, meaning they don't have a workplace violence policy or, I mean, a, um, excuse me, a concealed carry permit or it's not hunting season or, you know, they, they're saying they're using it for hunting but it's really a handgun, then that certainly is in violation of this, this law. So they're not, in it, quote unquote, protected under that. Um, so you then, of course, you could say, hey, you are not allowed to bring a firearm onto our company property, um, but it, it can, of course, end there. You must continue with the investigation about any threats, whatever disciplinary actions, and support measures um, to help that individual. Um, that's that's one you know recommendation I'm wearing, not as an HR person, but just as a, a security individual. Uh, I want to, uh, though, throw in something. This is something that really uh, bugs me about this, um, is that I, I believe that in many of the workplace violence shootings, especially like um, terminated employees, it's about justice. It's about rights. It's about uh, infringement on what they think, like a harm is done against them. There's a real strong sense of victimization, like you're treating me bad and keeping me different. What I'm sort of picturing the situation is the employee has a beef with management, is acting inappropriately, feels like management's out to get them, and then maybe they did something inappropriate, which might have been uh, a threat or throwing a stapler or kicking a trash can across the room, something like that. And then they're going to say, well, that's in violation of our policy. Well, guess what? You know, now you cannot have a firearm um, in your car, even though, in a sense, everybody else can. Uh, one of the issues, and this relates to the, the political discussion, is that people feel it's a Second Amendment right, and no employer, no one has the right to say you cannot, I cannot possess a, a firearm. Uh, also, I talked about uh, victimization, sort of being treated differently, and that's going to be uh, an issue. And then um, this is a mantra within the domestic violence um, community is that violence is about you know power and control. And so when uh, management comes in with this authority, removing someone's uh, rights, it, it becomes a control issue. And my whole concern, and I'd love to hear anyone else's opinion about this, is that it, there's a chance you can escalate the hostili hostility and resentment by prohibiting them. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm saying that you're, you're running that issue about um, stoking the flames. A any thoughts there, Jennifer, or anybody else? Well, I think when you're um, trying to deal with this kind of behavior and balancing out restricting, not restricting what your response is going to be. Mm -hmm. You need to do safety planning regardless of what your response is. So right. just assuming that restricting their access to a firearm is going to solve the issue or Thank reduce you. risk, it does not. So I think safety planning, anytime you have issues that raise any level of threat or concern about any safety issues at the workplace or uh, for your employees from outside threats, if they have a batter, for instance, that you have to do safety planning regardless of the initial steps you're taking. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, actually, uh, next month, uh, your colleague, uh, Joan Solzman, and I will be doing another program on security planning and threat management. So we, it's really a separate topic, but we're sure are going to address, you're right, you know, regardless of our policies, it comes down to, you know, real planning, the safety planning that's really important. Uh, one thing, uh, actually, I want to touch another thing about this uh, slide is, when we talk about uh, workplace violence policy, there's a broad, broad, many types, there's tons of free material, uh, free examples and the coalition puts out one as well. Um, you know, how are you defining a threat, harassment, intimidation? Assault is assault. Damage to property is easy to prove. But when we throw in these, if I could use the term, ambiguous uh, terms about what is intimidation, what's harassment, the thing I'm concerned about is could it be possible that an employer is going to be using these excuses, well, you looked at me funny, well, you can't have a firearm in your car. I know I'm being extreme there, you know, in my example, but we have to look at broadly what all the possibilities are because, well, truth is stranger than fiction, that there's going to be these really unusual cases that do pop up. Um, I hope my, I'm making my, my point clear there that if you're going to say, you know, you could prohibit them from violating the policy, you know, you have to really be really objective about what that violation is, uh, in my opinion. Um, okay, here's my real beef. Okay, this, again, this is very much, you know, trying to, to uh, in trying to be objective, but uh, this is my honest opinion. One of my major concerns um, regarding uh, this issue is not uh, intentional violence, but accidents. And um, I'll just skip ahead to one slide. Uh, this just happened. It was less than two weeks, I guess August 12th, um, when this occurred, 
like 12 days after the law came into effect, um, two people in the parking lot, one person showing another, there was no intent, no hostility, no, you know, apparently it was fine, but the gun went off and it shot, uh, it went through one employee's hand into the abdomen of the other employee. Uh, thankfully, they're both be fine, but my big issue are accidents. In, in my slide, I've got um, a link to this uh, blog post, and I just list a number of, of, of uh, cases where, uh, again, two people out in the parking lot, let me show you my new gun, or maybe they're selling someone a gun, and the gun went off accidentally. So that's, uh, uh, I think, one of the bigger risks that we're, we're running. Um, outside of, you know, intentional injury. Um, oh, so what can we do about that? One is, and again, people, you know, do they follow the policy is the question, that, you know, the rule says that it must be secured in the vehicle locked. It can't be, let's take it out and show somebody. Um, you could, I guess, drive off property if you're going to sell the gun or show the gun to somebody, but uh, they are not supposed to be taking it out of the car. Uh, in a number of the cases that I, I illustrated just a minute ago, many of those incidents happened in the car, and I have no idea how that works. So we got two employees both in the car together. He takes out the gun to show it. I think that's in violation because the, the firearm is supposed to remain out of sight. But uh, I think that's like a, a fine, fine detail within the law um, if that violates. Uh, point is, they, they, they just shouldn't be doing it. And then the bottom, the basis of that is always good gun safety. I mean, the, the real problem is mismanagement, mishandling of the firearm. And that's, that's something that um, can be addressed through training and experience. Uh, again, if there's any thoughts about that, I could I'd get back to it. Um, in support, it, um, while this has been really pushed through as is, is, is a Second Amendment writing about the, the idea that people are supposed to protect themselves to and from work, that they have a right to, you know, stay protected, um, you know, just broadly within the um, idea of stopping workplace violence or school shooting because a responsible citizen has a firearm. Uh, this is a, a, an Alabama case. Now, the uh, owner did not go out to his car and get it, but he just let someone go. The guy comes back and starts beating him up um, while he's becoming hostile. Uh, the uh, owner takes out the gun and fires a warning shot. It ricochets and hits the employee in the hand, and the argument's over. The, and uh, the employee was, the ex-employee was then charged with the assault, and the business owner was not. So, you know, this is pointing to an argument uh, that it could protect. I've got also, in all fairness, where is it? Um, the uh, when guns were used by employees or citizens or clients, where they were present during a rampage shooting, and they took out the firearm and stopped their rampage. So. Uh, I can't think of a single case where someone went out to their car, got their gun, came back to the workplace and stopped it, um, but that's possible that that, that cause scenario could occur. A any thoughts there? Just uh, go ahead and, and, and type in any comments you have in the questions area and I can read them out. Uh, one, one note I just want to put out there about... Um, I just had to throw this in here because I, I read this website called uh, postsecret.com and it's kind of interesting, people write a secret, or you're supposed to make your own postcard, put a secret on there, mail it to this place, and the guy scans them and posts them. Um, and then this is one I, I found a few years ago that you could you know, read right there. But I think there's this element of people who carry the firearms that recognizing that there's an element of, well, because the firearm is there. It could be used to stop violence, but you know, we have to look at these issues. One note, if you do go to this website, don't go to it at work, because sometimes they have like you know pornographic pictures up there, so just being aware. It's not one of those sites, but uh, people just post, you know, whatever they want, and uh, that's what pops up. Um, a couple of the thoughts, you know, we talked with attorneys, we talked with HR, talked to security, we're forgetting another important person there, the guy who uh, provides uh, insurance to the entities, and why I have not heard anything in Alabama about the insurance carriers having an impact, it does relate to an, uh, an, ins uh, an issue in Arkansas where a school district was uh, training and providing firearms to school to teachers and faculty. So they were giving, uh, they select a number of staff and faculty at a school and give them a stipend to buy a firearm and they do a firearm training and then they're going to arm these individuals. Well, there's a lot of uproar about that and the real um, showstopper was uh, the insurance carrier for the school district said, we're not going to insure you anymore. And so 
this is pure speculation on my behalf. How is this going to be impacting um, insurance premiums? I, I, I'm not sure, but as earlier, uh, Jennifer and I talked about the, the high rate of, of homicides or, or deaths when firearms are present. You know, if I'm a risk manager just crunching numbers, I'm going to say, hey, this place is more likely going to have a death. I've got to raise my premiums. Again, that's speculation on my, my behalf. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's heard anything different. Um, again, this is a very different issue because it's not just firearms in the parking lot. This is actually teachers and staff members uh, armed, you know, having a firearm on, on them in, in the school. So if we could, and, and I'd love to get anyone's uh, opinion on this, one question I've got is regarding a uh, hidden. So I believe within the law it says it must be out of sight, but then how do we say that? If I could say that for the f people that I know who carry, um, you know, they always say it needs to be accessible. You need to have it loaded. You need to have it um, chambered, and uh, and it's got to be within reach. And so, you know, is it that when you arrive in your workplace and you put it in your glove compartment, um, secure it in other ways? There's a lot of questions about uh, what's defined as being hidden. And I raised another point about people showing their gun. If you're both in the car together, is that in violation? Um, Again, I'm not an attorney making an interpretation. I, these are questions that I have um, as things uh, roll forward. Um, another question that, that's come into place is uh, many uh, employees work in the field. They drive. Now, we're not talking about company cars or company trucks, but if you're using your own vehicle and you're driving, um, one thing the law stipulates is if, if you're working and you, I suppose you're getting out of the car and let's say you're a, a sales rep and you're going into other people's businesses, um, even if that business, that location says firearms are, fi are fine and it's okay, as you as a representative of your company, can you have the firearm on your person where you're working outside, can you carry the firearm? Um, I, my interpretation of the law is this, that it's not okay that you cannot um, – do that, but again, that's just my interpretation. Yeah, I think the law allows employers to look at those issues, and it does allow employers to restrict when people are basically conducting the business of that particular employer. Right. right. We have our employees that are out in the field. We do a lot of in the field work here and doing various. We would prohibit uh, that weapon when they're conducting business. So while they're engaged in that, it's how we would define. But again, I think the law directs employers to look at that section to determine how they choose to restrict. Thank you. Thank you. So, so that certainly applies, let's say, when you get out of the car, but while you're driving in the car, it's, it's, it's a good, uh, good point. Uh, the other thing, while we're talking about in the field, like you work a certain region, uh, for those who travel a lot, it, it, it's another subject about um, people who fly and, you know, go out of state, you know, that travel issues. Uh, just from my personal experience, a lot of people who travel a lot and stay in hotels, they carry. And so, you know, it's, it's a really good question because it applies to other points where, you know, if you're staying in a hotel, you're not meeting with clients, but you're, you're, the reason you're in uh, Cincinnati is because of your job. Um, you know, there's there's questions about you know having the firearm. Where this is related to is is when let's say you're you go to a conference and everyone goes to conferences and you're at a conference and something happens at a meeting and you violate your your workplace violence policy. You violate some policy, even though you're off site in a sense because you're there representing the company and you're on duty. Then that's considered you know you're working and you have to follow your policies. That, I'm not saying that regarding this law, but it does apply to other things like sexual harassment or other workplace violence um, uh, laws or policies. Um, just thoughts, but golly, I know I wish I could give you tons of answers, but I'm just giving you more questions. Um, ah, this is another thing I thought of. I'm, you know, we're down here in the, in the south. Hunting season is, is around the corner. Um, it very often um, the question is about. Uh, you know, I showed you the picture before with the typical gun rack across the pickup truck. You know, in, in some ways, I've worked in places where it was really common. Everyone has a gun, and it's visible. It's right there, and the you know, on the, the the passenger seat. And uh, again, that's up to the the employer to make those decisions. But I think there are questions about um, in certain areas. It might be well, I can use the term a cultural norm um, to to see the firearms more accessible. Again, this may not apply at all to. Uh, regarding this, this law. Um, one issue when I've looked at other places is uh, 
many times people hunt before or after, and people are very passionate about hunting, and the best times are, you know, before work and right after work, so, you know, they're not going to go home to get their firearm, but they just want to come straight in from the field. Uh, so, uh, those are those issues. More! Okay, uh, and, and this is my speculation. Again, I'm not suggesting anything. I just had questions. When I looked at this, I'm like, okay, and forgetting about any legal perspective, um, is it possibility you're going to say, okay, well, we're going to allow this. I guess we've got to, but can you have a section that says, okay, if you have a firearm, then you must park here, maybe the furthest out. Um, I, I don't know if that's fair within the law, but I'm just trying to think of it from perspective. There's issues with that about identifying those individuals who carry because uh, those would be hot items for thieves. Like thieves would identify, oh, those are the cars that have guns. I'm going to bust into that car to get the gun. Um, I, I've just had a conversation once with the security director and they are suggesting, well, maybe we could develop, you know, firearm parking spaces. Uh, I don't think that actually will fly. Related to that is if you, if employees are bringing in firearms in their vehicle, can you can you have them inform? Are you going to keep a list of who does it and who doesn't? I, I don't know. Just say, Jennifer, with any of this, did, any thoughts there? Is that legal? Is that... Um... Well, no. I mean, basically the law refers to the employer has no obligation to investigate, uh, to question, to inquire, to do anything around whether a person has a firearms in their in their car. So I would say that because the law specifically says there's no duty to do that, then you would need to be very careful about engaging in just this general inquiry of that. I think that where the law allows it is where you have a employee that yes. is, has some behavioral issues and then you are directed to see if they have, or you're allowed rather in the law to see if they have a firearms and to make an inquiry as to right. whether that's a legitimate firearms. But I think that since the law specifically says you don't have a duty to do it, then you should be careful kind of imposing that upon yourself as a general policy of trying to figure out who has what. Thank you. That, that, I, I, that's why I figured that's, that's a, a really good point. Um, and so you would be real cautious. Again, like the bottom line is always, you know, have your, your own attorneys look at this and have them make these decisions. Uh, I put that out as, as, as speculation. Um, now, this really has nothing to do in, in, in too much with the actual firearms issues. I just want to throw in here, this is, I, I don't know if I've seen this in other states, um, but there was this provision saying if, if there's uh, any damages that, that flow from the from that firearm that's in the car, that there's this immunity. Now, it doesn't extend to, maybe you can help me out here, Jennifer, affirmative wrongful acts. Is that like if the employer shoots you, I mean, you can still shoot, you know, fire, sue them. But um, I, th that's my point. This this bottom line right here, that's that's Johnny Lee's opinion right there. I, I don't think um, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is, again, you want to engage in a direct liability discussion with your uh, attorneys because you want to figure out how this does impact your, your overall general liability of providing a safe workplace and how you deal with uh, adverse actions toward employees. So all that kind of flows into this related to firearms. But certainly if the employer is doing something that is uh, affirmative, again, in this, you know, that would promote an incredibly unsafe place, I would guess, and doing something outside of what are the limits within this law, you know, just dealing with firearms in the car. So if they're, if they're allowing some type of firearms activity that is way beyond what would be legitimate um, and, and someone gets injured, things like that, um, or if it's a, you know, public is allowed and they're, they're doing something that's increasing their risk, I'm assuming that's what it's referring to. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I'm real curious to see, uh, you know, how, if there's ever any attempts, you know, to do this and then they're going to, and a, a defense attorney is going to say, well, no, you know, this law protects us from immunity. I'm, I'm curious if there will ever be any uh, case law coming out of this. Yeah, I mean, eventually oh. there will be lawsuits from mm -hmm. this law at one way or the other if it mm -hmm. stays in place. Um, year after year as it is, eventually somebody will challenge something of it, uh, I'm assuming. Um, so we'll just have to see how that plays out. And I think it also has an impact, this law, on the type of employer that you are. I mean, that's mm. so specific to what you do, uh, public access, you know, how, all of these things, I think, in terms of what, you know, what you're actually conducting um, as far as business impacts this area, I think, okay. uh, in terms of risk and what's going on. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, while stopping shy of actually providing you with some verbiage, you know, some issues, you know, broadly, again, hopefully, oh, one law, oh, one, this is definitely a strong opinion, uh, a mandate from Johnny Lee. You really need to have a workplace violence policy. Whatever it might be, you can find that, but uh, one thing that is clear is that I believe a very strong uh, aggravating factor is if you do not have a policy and there's an incident that occurs, you know, that's going to be seen as, uh, in my opinion, uh, negligence on the employer's behalf. And so with that policy, what you want to do is, is revise it, if you haven't already, and your handbooks, your employee handbooks, to include these things that, you know, all the stipulations of the firearms that the owner must uh, have a permit or must follow under the, the hunting regulations. And please make it real clear that it only applies to their car and it must be out of sight and it must be locked. They cannot bring, I, I sometimes call this guns at work and it's really a misnomer because it, it doesn't say you can bring the firearm into the building. It just says you must keep it uh, uh, in the car. And then of course all the points you made earlier about the domestic violence uh, protective orders or violence convictions or felonies or mental health institution uh, commitments um, as well. Uh, secondly, you certainly want to explain very detailed about how this uh, can be uh, revoked and um, especially when we talk about what, what's defined as what it means to be um, in violation of the policy. Again, some of those terms like harassment, abuse, intimidation, that could be, it's really a subjective term. Um, and then of course that other weapons uh, could still be prohibited, which I think is odd, but um, you could still do that. A anything else you want to throw in there about um, revisions of policies or how, what employers should do? No, I mean, I think that just make, I think it's important to make sure that your employees understand what their rights are in terms mm -hmm. of what they can and cannot do, and that there is a, a clear a risk management for when issues are identified, uh, and not just things at work, but also when you have people who have risk issues at home, yes. that as we've stated many times, that often can um, cause issues in the workplace. It doesn't mean that we treat those people in a negative light, it means they need your partnership in order to help make them safe. And so mm -hmm. I think just building all of that into your workplace policy makes people understand before these things occur what they're supposed to do. Right. Thank you. Um, absolutely, policy is, is just like letters on a screen or a, a, a piece of paper. It really, the real issues comes down to training and dissemination, why you could push out the memo. This also gives opportunity to revisit a, a, uh, your workplace violence uh, training. So get out there and talk to the employees. And while we, you're, you know, the point is to uh, explain this new law and provisions, the real opportunity is looking at things like warning signs, uh, showing people how to report, how to uh, look at red flags, um, especially around the intimate partner violence about recognizing signs of abuse from an, a victim or an abuser, and then encouraging them, helping them know how to report. Even though we're talking about policies and, and liability and things like that, the real, real mission is stopping the violence. And you could you could prepare your employees, you can you know train your con constituents to um, to help you be allies in uh, prevention. And that's what ultimately what we all want to do is is prevent um, any kind of intentional harm and unintentional from accidents as well. Um, uh, golly, it, my, my, my final line, I always end with this slide, and we may be even, oh, ending uh, a little early. Well, it's about 45 minutes. Um, you know, the bottom line is even though we're talking about guns and, and uh, security issues, it, like the real pr primary prevention, the real prevention is, is developing these healthy workplaces where people recognize when someone's in trouble. Or you know, conversely, if you see someone who's, um, you know, maybe what can be considered a potential assailant or, or perpetrator, often these individuals are going through quite a bit of emotional, psychological, financial, personal struggles, and they're, they're at the end of their, their rope, and they're, they're struggling. If we could offer support, recognize it, and then put in those support measures through employee assistance programs, things like that, we can help uh, prevent the incident from even, you know, let's get rid of the motive. Forget about, like, the means of the violence. Let's get rid of that desire to... Um, commit harm somehow. Um, uh, did, uh, we can open up for questions, or uh, I, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else, um, Jennifer? Um, no, I mean, I think that part of what we see in terms of the intimate partner violence and workplace connection is that uh, victims are afraid 
to disclose for adverse having adverse employment actions against them. And I think that part of the healthy environment is uh, having your workforce clearly state to its employees, we care about you, and if mm -hmm. there are issues related to your safety, we're going to partner with you. And there are yes. lots of strategies for how to do that that's not going to be onerous on the workplace at all, but actually promote uh, and enable a person instead of losing someone you may have invested a lot of time and training mm -hmm. on being able to keep that person and they're going to be a productive part of your workforce by this partnership. So I think just being generally aware of what's going on with your workforce and then educated as to how to deal with whatever issues are arising is really important to keep that well-trained productive workforce that you need rather than having a high turnover which is going to obviously right. have a you know negative impact on you. Absolutely. Um, when I open up I was going to touch on a couple other things. I don't know if any, any more questions or we can go back to slides, uh, present some other items. Um, please, I'm just going to ramble a little bit about some uh, different issues, but um, if I could um, please uh, you know, ask any questions right now that may come up. I just want to direct you all to the uh, Coalition's website, and there are a number of, of programs um, coming up and occurring, we have the Economic Justice uh, Summit coming up on September 19th in Montgomery, um, which would be a great program. Uh, hopefully you all can come in, and join us for that. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Joan and I will be covering uh, threat assessment security measures for domestic violence assaults on September 17th, and that's uh, same bat time at 11.30 a.m. Central Time, so please join us for that if you're able to. Um, and maybe you've got some other questions that will come up later. Uh, if you um, reply back to the follow-up email, we can answer. And if you have questions directly for uh, Ms. Jennifer, I'd be glad to forward those emails on to her as well. Um, other than that, if there's, there's anything else that, that anyone wanted to add, any final questions? Or Jennifer, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, no, I mean, I would just, I, I just thank everybody for participating and kind of understanding that it's, it, assessing what is before you is probably the most important thing you're ever going to do, mm -hmm. regardless if we're talking about civil, criminal, or employers, is being able to see the red flags or see what's going on and then be able to ask the right questions mm -hmm. uh, to figure out and assess for risk, not just mm -hmm. risk for, you, for your employee agency, but for the employees. So I think getting more training on assessment and red flags is really crucial and is a, a partnership with doing very effective HR policies around firearms or anything else. Great. Absolutely. Well, th well th thank you so much. I've, uh, you all will get uh, about an hour, like a link to this webinar recording, and then there will also be the, the, the slides as well that you could obtain. And, and then also there will be a certificate of attendance, so if you need this for CEUs, you could just fill that out. Uh, also, you could always use the email confirmation you'll get saying thanks for attending. You could use that for uh, certificate of attendance as well, or proof of attendance. Um, all right, well, let me, uh, I'll, I'll stop the recording.